I remember when Pillars of Eternity's Kickstarter was announced in 2012. It was pitched as a successor to the old Infinity Engine games, games like Planescape Torment and Baldur's Gate 2, both of which were in turn based off of second edition Dungeons and Dragons. So you can understand why I assumed Pillars of Eternity would continue the tradition of those games wholesale, with no questions asked. I was wrong. Instead, game director Joshua Sawyer saw Pillars as an opportunity to fix long-standing issues with the RPG genre. One of his primary goals was to increase the number of viable builds by altering the functions of traditional ability scores. This also meant that Pillars would be, in a strictly mechanical sense, vastly different than its D&D ancestors. To talk about how they accomplished this and why it's so impressive, we first need to take a closer look at some of the intricacies of tabletop RPGs and the video games they influenced. If you've been playing games for as long as I have, you've probably run into these six stats. Strength, Dexterity, Constitution, Intelligence, Wisdom, and Charisma. They are, of course, the original ability scores from Dungeons & Dragons. Early D&D books suggest rolling for the ability scores at random as the standard option. The first roll would go to Strength, the second to Dexterity, and so on. You rolled the dice to see what character you could be not the other way around. In the early 2000s, and as video games using these rules became more and more popular, the standard way of distributing ability scores changed. 3rd edition D&D and Pathfinder both suggest rolling six times and then assigning those six numbers to the abilities of your choice. Meanwhile, video games move towards a point-by system, where you're given a pool of points to distribute however you see fit. This fundamentally changed the way players approached character building. Instead of generating heroes with random numbers, players would carefully design their characters around optimal builds. And the way ability scores worked at a mechanical level was never adjusted for this new mentality. This is an adjustment score for Constitution in early AD&D. Here's one for Dexterity, and a third for Strength. There are dead ranges where the ability scores don't influence stats in any meaningful way. It's almost never worth it to let an ability score sit between 7 and 14 because those increases don't matter nearly as much as the increase from 3 to 4 or from 15 to 16. And this happens in modern RPGs as well, most notably in Dark Souls, where the benefits from vitality start ramping up around 20 before they drop at 30 and then drop even more at 50. These dead ranges invite min-maxing, where players prioritize two or three attributes and dump the rest. And since certain ability scores in D&D had little to no impact on certain builds, finding which stats to dump was most of the time the key to creating a powerful character. As long as players kept dump stats around four, where the dead ranges usually started, they could safely throw the bulk of their points into more appealing stats. The more dump stats and dead ranges there are, the easier it is for players to find what's optimal. If optimal builds are easy to find, then game designers need to balance their content around those optimal builds. And in doing so, they make what were optimal builds into merely viable builds, and they turn whatever was a viable build into trash. This dynamic is what cuts down on the number of viable builds in a game to just a handful. This is, of course, Diablo 2, home to one of the most obvious dump stats in all of gaming. It's called Energy, and your character doesn't need it. Unless you're an Energy Shield Sorceress, or maybe a Warcry Barbarian, two popular builds among dozens, you shouldn't drop a single point into it. It's the dump stat to end all dump stats. Diablo's harder difficulties are balanced around characters that barely touch it, so characters that do invest into energy will probably hit a roadblock sooner or later because they didn't throw enough points into vitality. So what does Pillars do differently to avoid all of this? In a sentence, the developers made each of its attributes benefit each of its classes. First, they created three defenses, Fortitude for withstanding physical attacks, Reflex for dodging them, and Will for resisting attacks of the mind. And as Joshua Sawyer himself puts it, these defenses are not opt-out. To a certain degree, they're all required for survival. And each of the defenses is influenced by two of the six attributes in Pillars of Eternity. So no matter what point you put where, you gain some defense from it. 
Second, they disassociated class abilities from attributes. In D&D, ability scores are explicitly linked to class features. Sorcerers, for example, are forced to stock up on charisma since it determines how effective their spells are on the battlefield. In Pillars, attributes alter the base stats of each character in ways that are beneficial to every class. Take a fighter, for instance. In D&D, you'll want to grab strength or dexterity for damage, constitution for health, some wisdom for mental saves, and then dump whatever's left. In Pillars, it's a bit more nuanced. You could take might for damage or constitution for health, but the rest of the attributes are just as helpful. Dexterity will increase your action speed, perception will increase your chances to interrupt, while resolve will stop you from being interrupted yourself, and intellect will lengthen the duration of abilities like knockdown. All the while, these attributes also increase your character's defenses. Pillars of Eternity does away with dead ranges by making each point count linearly. The first point in any attribute will make as much difference as the last, so one point here or there in an attribute you otherwise won't touch doesn't mean you're cheating yourself out of bigger gains down the line. This small change makes it harder to totally botch a build, and greatly increases the amount of viable builds across the board. This system opens doors to a lot of interesting creations that would be impossible to roleplay as in the Infinity Engine games or classic D&D. You can make the dumb wizard work. You can own the battlefield as the smart but physically weak warrior, and as the clumsy rogue, you can be just as deadly as your more agile party members. But there are some downsides. Since attributes benefit characters linearly, they can sometimes feel like they lack the impact when compared to other games. Also, since attributes benefit so many stats in so many different ways, Pillars chose to not let you permanently gain attribute points after you leave the character creation screen. That kind of robs the game of a feeling of progression, the same sense of progression that, in my opinion, makes tabletop RPGs so appealing. But I don't want to let that detract from what the team behind Pillars achieved. I'm not really talking about what they achieved in a design sense, though I do think it's impressive. I'm talking about how they had the guts to take a set of rules that were created over 40 years ago. A set of rules that are propped up by a legion of fanboys that influenced an entire genre of video games. A set of rules that they took and had the dedication and the resolve to change. Thanks so much for watching. Let me know what you thought of Pillars in the comments or on Twitter. If you liked the video, then feel free to subscribe. And if you're interested in supporting the channel, then you can hop on over to our Patreon account. The link to it is in the video summary. As always, there's more to come. Stay tuned.